I'm the mom who knows nada. My name is Brianna. This is the Mama Knows Nada podcast. We have a really special guest today to talk about her latest book. It is Unlikely Heroes, A New War on Cancer um, by Christina Marusek. She is going to share what inspired her to tell the story and why, most importantly for our listeners, it is vital that parents tune in. So, Christina, thank you so much for being here. I got to skim through this, so I'm really excited to have you on here to chat about this because I feel like there's so much in here that parents don't know they need to know. So, can you tell me a little bit about what stories and situations prompted you to write this? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me and for um, wanting to share these stories and these ideas with parents and with moms. Um, I'm a stepmom. Mm. I'm a stepmom. And so that's certainly something I am thinking about when I'm thinking about these issues too. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing that, that kind of brought me to this subject matter is um, that my younger sister, Abby, was diagnosed with thyroid cancer when she was 25 years old. Mm. And we're very close in age. I was, um, I'm two years older, so I was 27 at the time. And 25 is very young for a cancer diagnosis. So um, that was really scary. It caught our family off guard. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, her doctors told us that thyroid cancer usually runs in families. um, And there's a kind of genetic component to risk. Mm. Uh, but no one else in our family had ever had it and no one else has had it since. And so, you know, her doctor said in this kind of offhanded way that, oh, in that case, like maybe she was exposed to something in the environment that might've raised her cancer risk. But when we had follow-up questions about that, they really didn't know how to answer them. They didn't have additional information. Um, most physicians get very little training in environmental health in medical school. It's just not something Mm -hmm. they know a lot about. And um, when we kind of went Googling on our own, we also had a hard time coming up with anything that was very helpful or insightful. And I'm also an investigative reporter. So um, uh, several years after her diagnosis, I wrote, uh, I had gotten a job working on stories related to environmental health. Um, I started working for an organization called Environmental Health News, which is published by another organization called Environmental Health Sciences. um, And that's where I still work full-time today. Um, And I did this series of stories about how uh, Pittsburgh in Western Pennsylvania, which Mm -hmm. is where my sister and I live, had higher than Uh, state average and higher than national average rates for um, a handful of cancers that have strong links to environmental exposures. Mm. Um, And I, the series was an exploration of why that's happening. So I looked at the region's ongoing problems with industrial air pollution. I looked at what kind of pollutants are in the water. Um, I spoke with lots of kind of national and global experts on environmental health and cancer. And um, that series uh, won a couple of awards and I got a really nice note from an editor at a book publisher that specializes in books about the environment saying, congratulations on these awards. I think this reporting is really important. Would you have Mm -hmm. any interest in turning this into a book with a national scope? And so this is that Mm. book. Um, so (laughs) it very directly came out of my, my personal and family experience, um, navigating a cancer diagnosis Mm -hmm. and then, you know, my work as an investigative reporter. And, um, I should add that my sister is doing great. She's been in remission for 10 years. Um, she had her, her thyroid removed and went through treatment and, you know, now she has two super cute kids who I get to be an aunt to. So she was definitely one of the lucky ones. Oh, that's wonderful news because I was going to say, like, is your sister okay? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <Ooh. laughs> Don't leave people hanging. She's doing yeah. great. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Well, I think that's so important, like, that you're highlighting, like, this new war on cancer. But also, I love that you bring it back to these environmental factors because there are so many things in our day-to-day lives. And I chat with this a little bit in – um with other people and there's, I I feel like in my discussions with parents and people, um, but particularly moms that there's this like redirection, like back to nature, like organic, all natural, like 
stuff things and, you know, even like plastics, we don't really understand mm -hmm. how many issues there are with plastics and having things in plastic and heating things in plastic. And then you like, my husband yeah. thinks I'm crazy. And I'm like, no, we're getting rid of all the plastic. And we're in the middle <laughs> of a move. So it's like a perfect time to purge. Uh, but yep. so I love that you're talking about these things that whether it's in an area like Pittsburgh, which is highly industrial, um, it, or whether it's just in your household, like there are so many things yeah. impacting our well-being just in general. So as you're talking to these people and you're diving into these, and it, it also like in a tangent, it seems like these things like kind of came together for you. Like it was like a merging of passions. Like obviously you care about your sister and her well-being, and then you're already an investigative journalist that is specializing in environmental factors. So that, that looks like, well, hello, like that was very poignant. Um, yeah. So as you're talking to these people and, and watching your sister go through this experience, what did you discover? Yeah. So I learned while I was, while I was reporting that original series, I learned a couple things that were um, really shocking to me that I didn't know about cancer and the environment. Mm -hmm. And the first was that um, in the United States and then also at the global level, rates of cancer in children and young adults like my sister um, have been steadily rising since we started tracking rates in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And it's a pretty drastic increase. Um, when you look at rates of childhood leukemia, which is the most common type of childhood cancer, mm -hmm. um, it has increased 35% since the 70s. And um, childhood brain cancer, which is the second most common type of childhood cancer, has increased increased uh, 38%. And that's for the United States. But again, anywhere you pull up these charts, they look pretty much the same. And that is a diagonal line going up across the page. And I spoke with, when I was working on that series, I spoke with this really brilliant um, epidemiologist and pediatrician. So mm -hmm. he also has that helpful Venn diagram of thinking about kids' health and thinking about, um, you know, what's happening in the environment. And he, uh, his name is Dr. Phil Landrigan. He ended up writing the foreword to my book. And he said something that totally blew my mind when I interviewed him as a journalist for that series I was doing. Um, he said, you know, this change is too fast to be uh, genetic because genetic changes mm. happen over like centuries and not a period of decades. And um, this also, sometimes when we see a rapid increase in disease, we see uh, it's because of better diagnostic tools. So mm. it's because we get better at diagnosing something that's kind of always been there, but we just didn't have a way to track it. And he mm. said, when it comes to childhood cancer, that's not what's happening because the most common childhood cancer types like leukemia, we're using the same diagnostic tools as we have been since the 1970s. So wow. he said, this is a real uh, rapid and alarming increase in cancer in kids and young adults. And uh, the one thing that has changed a lot over the same, same time period is the number of uh, cancer causing chemicals we're all exposed to on just kind of a daily basis in our everyday lives. Um, you know, he pointed out that in the last hundred years, uh, humans have invented 300,000 new manufactured chemicals. Wow. And some of them are great. Some of them have really helped us and solved a lot of problems. Some of them have helped us treat drinking water so it's safe. Some of them cure cancer, you know, um, but most of them haven't been tested for safety, specifically haven't been tested for safety to kids before they're just kind of put on the market. And then in the United States specifically, even when we do test chemicals and find out that they're harmful, they generally just kind of stay on the market. So in the last 50 years, uh, only five chemicals have been removed from uh, the marketplace in the United States because they're found to be harmful, even though we know, you know, hundreds of them cause cancer or raise our cancer risk. Um, so I think there's this kind of, I think people generally think in the United States that like, if it's available in the store, it's safe. It's been yes. tested for safety. And so I was really <laughs> shocked um, and disturbed to learn that that's actually just not true. It is staggering. And you can look at it in particular um, 
And just like makeup, for example, how many mm-hmm. chemicals like are banned in Europe? Like if you go to Europe, there's like 500 different like additives, chemicals, blah, blah, that are banned from any makeup products. There's like yep. 12 in the U.S., something something like drastically crazy like that. And there's like 100 I actually banned. Have that- I actually have that number in front of me because I wanted to mention really? it. So, yeah, the European Union has banned or restricted more than 2,400 chemicals in cosmetics, oh, and the yeah. U.S. has banned or restricted nine, nine okay. of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there was more so, than I thought. The last time I read it a couple of years ago, there was like only a few hundred in, in the EU. That is incredible yeah. to know. Ah, oh my god! <laughs> and then it's also it's not just you know it's not just the European Union. Um, there are at least eighty other countries around the world that have more stringent regulations on chemicals in cosmetics and personal care products than we do here in the United States. Okay, so when you're getting all this information. I mean, this is obviously like overwhelming, frustrating. And also it makes me be like, why isn't this more well known? And I feel like it's becoming more well known. So when, as you're taking in all this research and talking to these people, what was it about these discoveries that made you feel compelled to really put the ink on paper and get the message out there? Yeah, I um so another thing I learned uh well when I started researching this was that um right now only 7 to 9% of global cancer funds go toward prevention and um that felt crazy to me. I started thinking about that in terms of our war on cancer. This is uh relates to the title of the book which is how the United States has talked about, you know, our fight against cancer and I realized that um, that would be like, if this was a literal war, that would be like spending uh, 91% of our resources, our war budget on treating people who came, who got wounded, treating people who came back from the battlefield wounded or treating wow. civilians who got wounded and only uh, 9% of it on offensive and defensive measures that could stop them from getting hurt in the first place, which felt feels crazy, right? That does not feel like an effective way to wage a war. And there are two two kind of big reasons that the funding shakes out that way. Um, The first is that there's a whole bunch of money to be made by investing in treatments and cures. Um, I've looked at this page for investors about projected growth in the global oncology market, and it kind of cynically says this is a great place to invest because cancer rates are expected to double in the next 40 years, which is, uh, you know, disturbing to see it couched in those terms. Um, but right, investors can make a lot of money, a lot of money by um, funding research into cures and treatments. And of course, cures and treatments are super important. I would never want to say we should do less of that. That's what saved my sister's life. I'm so grateful we have those. We've made huge advancements in cancer treatments in the last 100 years because they're well-funded. But there's this huge amount of stuff we could be doing uh, for prevention that would prevent many cancer cases that we're just not doing right now. Um, So the other reason that you know, treatments get funded and, and prevention doesn't, is that it's it's a lot harder to get people to relate to prevention. So we tend to, um, when we talk about cancer prevention, we often talk about statistics and data mm. and like long-term trends and that stuff is important, but it's a lot harder to connect with emotionally, right? So when mm. you want to um, ask someone for help uh, raising money to fund a cure, you can put the picture of a little girl who's battling cancer on the t-shirt and on the Facebook page. And of course, we all feel empathy and we all mm-hmm. want to help out, help out. but it's just the nature of prevention that we don't get to meet the person whose cancer we prevented. We don't get like a hug from a mom who's saying thank you so much for stopping my child from getting cancer. And so um, it's part of the reason I I structured my book through profiles and that my book is really uh, – it's a, it, there is data, there's data and there are facts in there, but I really tried to make it story heavy. It's really mm-hmm. focused on stories because I wanted to kind of put a face to cancer prevention and to this new movement that says um, we could be doing a lot more when it comes to preventing cancer. And that's about human stories too, right? Yeah, I think, and I think that putting it, there's like, I mean, I don't know if it's technically like a vignette style, but having these like, micro profiles on these people it it really does let you connect with 
the care like not the characters because these are real people that these events actually happen but like you can be like oh my gosh and it and you i think you do a brilliant um way of like we weaving the facts in there very organically so that people don't feel like it's so like dense but it's also very accessible and i just want to read this um this is in your intro. And I thought when I read this, I I got like goosebumps because I feel like it kind of surmises what you're saying about all this, you know, that we only, we have a, a, a million dollars, but we're only g- giving like, you know, nine ninety thousand 90,000 to like prevention. Right. So this was very poignant to me. Like while there are around 80,000 chemicals that are used in products sold to American consumers, fewer than 1% or 800 have ever been tested for toxicity or safety. And existing regulations on cancer causing chemicals in consumer products are rarely enforced. Uh, What does this fact mean for the average person? So, um, a lot. Yeah. It means a lot for all of us. So, so I, I do think it's worth, um, saying and recognizing that most of these, uh, harmful exposures that we get are in very, very small doses. Um, but historically when there has been like testing or research on, is this chemical safe for consumers? Is it okay to be in consumer products? Um, that research typically just looks at one chemical at a time. And, you know, there's this old adage that the dose makes the poison. And Mm. we're increasingly finding that that's actually not quite true, um, especially when it comes to chemicals that are known as endocrine disruptors, um, Mm -hmm. which interrupt our normal hormonal systems and can cause all sorts of problems, including elevating our cancer risk. And so, when historically, when research has just looked at like one of these chemicals at a time, it'll say like, oh, this dose is small enough to be safe. It's not going to majorly raise anyone's cancer risk. But that doesn't consider that we're being exposed to dozens of chemicals simultaneously, kind of all throughout our day. And so um, researchers more recently decided this is important. We should be thinking about this. We should be (laughs) studying this. Um, And between 2012 and 2015, there was this group of more than 350 cancer researchers and doctors from 31 countries who gathered uh, in Halifax, Canada to try and look at the kind of cumulative effects of these constant low dose exposures we're Mm -hmm. all getting. And uh, the investigation is called the Halifax project. That's why I mentioned where they met. Um, And they found that these constant low dose exposures can add up in a really significant way. And also that they're not necessarily, they can be more than additive. So because these chemicals like combine and interact in our bodies, Mm -hmm. um, they, it can add up to more than one chemical plus one chemical equals a two on risk. It can be more like one plus one equals seven when it comes to how much risk wow. they're creating because oh. of the way they interact in our bodies. So uh, in the United States, especially because we've mentioned that we're pretty lax on our chemical regulations, um, we really need our regulators to rethink the way that they're testing chemicals for safety in a way that takes this into consideration, the fact that we're in the real world, we're actually exposed to many chemicals mm-hmm. kind of all at once on, a, on an ongoing basis. And we need to, you know, step up our enforcement of our existing regulations if we want to prevent cancer in a meaningful way. Well, that is such, I mean, I think that's just like mind boggling and flabbergasting, first of all. So basically all these chemicals are you know, they're like multiplying or compounding themselves is what it sounds like to a degree. And there's, I'm sure there's variations on the, whichever ones uh, and how they interact. That's a very, very simplified explanation of what happened (laughs) at the Halifax project. Just to put the caveat in there. Yeah. Bring it, bring it down to my level. Some of these chemicals. No, no, I mean what I said. That's a disclaimer about what I said. Just that, you know, if you want to go read about the Halifax project, there's a lot more complexity. And that's, that's my understanding of what we've learned there. Oh, that sounds like, well, it's probably very true too, but like, it just, that is, first of all, that's just insane that you, we could have these 
different chemicals basically like compounding themselves and we think it's a small dose but because it's paired with you know a different chemical compound it has a different reaction right within our bodies because we're all like chemistry sets and we're all different so what what i can literally tolerate is not probably the same that you can tolerate you know if there's variables exactly right um so I, I, anyway, I just wanted to like kind of noodle on that point that you made because I just think it's absolutely insane. <laughs> so. Yeah. And then oh. this is even, this is also crazy, maybe crazier. So when it comes to these endocrine disrupting chemicals that I mentioned, mm-hmm. um, those are kind of everywhere and we're learning more and more about the problems they cause. And um, it's not their link to cancer is a little bit less clear, but research is kind of increasingly suggesting that they might be involved in hormone related cancers because of the way they interact with our hormonal systems. And that would include stuff like um, breast cancer, testicular cancer, thyroid cancer, anything that's kind of in a thyroid regulated part of the body. Um, Interesting. But uh, scientists have actually realized that for some of those chemicals, low doses can be even more problematic than high doses, that very low doses um, have a different effect on our hormonal systems than very high doses do as a kind of like basic measure of toxicity. And it's oh. really complicated and like very counterintuitive and hard to explain. Um But so we're figuring out that like, you know, maybe the dose doesn't make the poison. (laughs) Maybe we actually need to look at things a little bit differently. That's like a very kind of, you know, elementary understanding of of how these chemicals work in our bodies. Um, And then other research has also started to suggest that our exposure to these kinds of chemicals can increase um, our kids' risk of cancer, but then also our grandchildren's oh. risk of developing cancer. So, um, you know, it's not just our health that is at stake when we're exposed to these chemicals, but there can be kind of multi-generational effects from these harmful exposures. It is so crazy you said that because I was, there's like this meme or something I saw and you, it's like when you saw, a woman is pregnant, right? all the cells are like imprinting and there's like a bunch of science and I'm not good with like breaking down science, obviously. Um, I'm a writer. Okay. (laughs) Do what I can with what I got. Um, But anyway, there's like this picture and it's like this very holistic and it really made me think it's like, so when a woman is pregnant, she is carrying not only the second generation, but the third generation, because every, all like your like sperm and eggs is every, it's all within the individual you're carrying when they're born. So by the time that child That's is exactly born, right. you're you know you've not only impacted yourself and changed you, you're impacting the child plus the next generation. So in one transaction, if you will, you're impacting three generations. So this is yeah. like what you're saying. It's like you're not you're yeah. taking the stuff in. It's affecting our kids, whether we're pregnant or or before like prenatal postpartum whatever it is and then it's impacting them too so yeah it's sort of wild to think about yeah (laughs) i saw this image and then i was like reading and there's like scientific facts i don't remember in there but i was like i never thought of that but it's like oh man it's so true so all the things that we're doing today like what you're saying with all these chemicals that it's not only impacting us but the future generations i think that is the most important like well to me i'm like that makes my head explode in so many ways. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I agree. Me too. <laughs> I want to talk a bit about your book and some of the stories that you shared. Is there anyone in particular that was that stands out or that had the most impact to you, on you directly outside of your experience with your sister? Yeah, we've been talking about, um, you know, personal care products and cosmetics. And there's a chapter in the book that's focused on um, a researcher named Ami Zoda, who's at Columbia University. And her research is about um, Mm. harmful chemicals in in personal care products and cosmetics with a focus on racial disparities. So she's done a lot of work that shows that um, you know, there are higher levels of a bunch of toxic chemicals in products that are primarily marketed to women of color um, and in particular black women in the United States. And then she also looks a lot at how like systemic racism um, impacts 
shopping choices in those communities. So, um, for example, um, there's been research that shows that, uh, women who use, um, relaxers regularly several times a year, like hair relaxers to make your hair kind of permanently Mm -hmm. straight, um, have a much higher risk of uterine cancer than women who don't. And, um, you know, for communities that have are more likely to have naturally curly hair for women of color and again particularly black women in the United States um that the drive to kind of straighten your hair and have straight hair is a lingering survival adaptation from Mm -hmm. Uh, slavery because white colonizers Mm -hmm. and enslavers used real and perceived racial differences like skin color and hair texture to treat black women as less than human right they and so it became a survival adaptation to have straighter hair and look more white or approximate kind of white beauty standards Mm -hmm. and there are also still um in about half of the states in the united states it's still legal for workplaces to ban traditional hairstyles for black women um Mm -hmm. There was last year, there was federal legislation proposed that would have made that illegal in all 50 states. It passed the House, but not the Senate. So there are still a bunch of states where your workplace can say you have to, essentially, you have to use these toxic beauty products if you're a woman of color in order to adhere to the dress code. Mm -hmm. Um, And so her work really calls on researchers who study environmental health to start thinking about issues like gender and race when they're thinking about people's exposure to harmful chemicals in the real world. You know, she was Mm -hmm. saying that um, historically when researchers have tried, when mostly white male researchers have tried to look at um, how uh, why communities of color like had higher rates of disease, they would look at everything in the environment, uh, which ended up actually being a much shorter list than it should have been that included things like what's in their air and what's in their water and what's in the building they live in. And are they close to a major source of traffic? Um, But they generally did not consider uh, are they using beauty products that contain a bunch of toxic chemicals because of, uh, you know, racial norms, racial beauty norms in the United States. Um, And so she was really saying you're missing a huge part of the picture if you're Mm -hmm. not considering the ways that um, sex and gender and race uh interact with you know the the choices we make and the toxic chemicals we're exposed to um and ami is uh indian american and you know you you mentioned the book's kind of structure that it's um so it's structured through pro- profiles of people who are leading this work and i don't so i don't just write about her research but i also write about like her family's history and how her mm. parents um immigrated to the united states from india and what it was like for her growing up in rural north carolina as the only indian american kid in her school Whoa, um wow. and all these stories about like her personal history that really have um inspired her work and that drive her in her work and that kind of shaped her thinking um and i Yeah, I also, in the chapter about Ami, um, it opens with her hanging out, me and her hanging out with her five, her daughter was five at the time, now she's like seven. Um, Really cute, very sassy little girl who was desperate to try on her mom's makeup. And so as we're talking about, you know, harmful chemicals and what to avoid and what's in beauty products, um, I was watching her daughter like go through her makeup box Mm -hmm. and ask what everything was and want to put makeup on. Um, And so... Yeah, it includes details about her research, research, which is really important. But then also, I think what brought me in um, to wanting to know more about that was like learning these people's stories and feeling like, um, you know, this can all feel kind of scary and overwhelming when you're first learning about this. Mm -hmm. And I think once I found out that there are these really brilliant people who've devoted their whole lives and their whole careers to solving this problem, and I started hearing their stories about what motivated them to do that, um, that made me feel a lot more hopeful and uh, inspired to try and figure out ways that I could help out. And so I included those stories because I hope it does that for readers too. Ooh, and I think you're bringing up such a quintessential point that we're becoming, we have become more and more aware of. And I would argue that I don't know exactly how old you are, but I feel like we're, based on what you said, we're similar ages, but that we're just like, okay, this isn't fair. This isn't right. We have yeah. to like, let's redirect the the course. Like I live here in Florida and you, I think 
they passed like the crown act and it was like the first thing where women of color could actually wear their natural hair and mm. as a, like as a white as a white woman I never have to think about I couldn't wear my hair curly straight down up pigtails ponytails like that was never mm -hmm. against me I've never thought about relaxing or perming my hair I'd never crossed my mind but there are women for generations and that's just one example that you've given that yeah. women in particular let's just focus on yeah. that for a second because women in particular have been chastised and especially women of color have been pigeonholed and they've been discriminated against. It's literally in our laws. And then yeah. the other fact that uh, you pointed out too, is that so many of these researchers only do research with and for males. So they're yeah. like talking about, Oh, this is impacts the body, but you're talking about like a six foot, 200 pound male. How, yeah. how does it impact a five, five, 150 pound woman? Like, come on here. <laughs> like there's yeah. a big scope of humanity that we have to account for. <laughs> You're that, absolutely right. Oh, yeah. Love that you pointed that out. Like that. I think that is so crucial to understanding that things aren't really fair in so many ways. Um, yeah. So and that's, that's part of why actually knowing that and knowing that so much medical research has just like excluded <sighs> women in these ways that are still impacting us. Um, all of the researchers who I talked to for my book are women because <laughs> I was aware of that going in. Obviously, yeah. there are men who can do great research and who can include men in their research. But um, I was excited to, you know, have come across um, women who are doing this really brilliant uh, important work. And I'm happy that I got to highlight their stories. Oh, it's so it sounds like it was a very fascinating journey for you to take to in, in a lot of different ways. So without giving too much away of the book, um, is there anything that the average person can do or the preventative measures that you can start small to like work your way up to, to kind of mitigate your exposure to certain chemicals? Oh, and is there any one chemical in particular that is like runaway red flag dive under into a bunker <laughs> kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, good questions. I I really try to emphasize in the book that the only way we're going to solve this is through systemic change that would protect everyone. So ultimately we need better regulations and we need safer chemicals. So a lot of the book focuses on how can we do that and like how can how can all of us pitch in to achieve mm. that kind of big picture goal. But in the meantime, you know, uh, people are freaked out. That's ch big change takes a while. So in the meantime, there are a couple steps um and these are kind of sprinkled throughout the book because, of course, I asked every researcher, like, so what should I be doing differently in my house while, yeah, yeah. <laughs> while I have you, while I have you? Um, <laughs> so there are a couple big things that I think um, – we can do to be safer. It's, I also want to emphasize that it's not about being perfect or trying to a hundred percent avoid these chemicals. That's just not possible. So it's really about doing the stuff that's accessible to you. Um, and where you can take a couple big swings to just kind of lower your overall exposure and the exposures for your family. And so the first one is, um, getting a really good water filter for your home. Um, okay. unfortunately American tap water, uh, has a bunch of chemicals in it that can raise our cancer risk. Um, most of our federal drinking water regulations are more than 20 years old. And so uh, just because your water is passing federal drinking water regulations does not mean that it's safe. Um, there was a study that came out recently that found that 45% of American tap water contains PFAS, um, PFAS, which are for those forever chemicals a lot of people are talking mm -hmm. about right now. And okay. those are linked to all kinds of health effects, including elevated cancer risk. Um, so a good water filter at home is really important. And um, there are a couple of brands that are better than others that remove a lot of chemicals of concern, including PFAS. Um, the, the couple of brands that I know uh, were just recently tested by a research group and were found to remove 100% of PFAS specifically are um, Zero Water, okay. um, another brand called Clearly Filtered, and a third one called Berkey Travel. And all three of those brands are available on Amazon. I think sometime, some of them may be in Target. And they're like home water pitchers. So you don't, oh, cool. this isn't like a whole house system. 
they, you know, those are available if that's something you want to look into, but for like immediate cost effective, um, you know, quick thing, uh, these are pitcher filters that you can keep on your counter or your fridge. Um, the, the next one, big one is filtering indoor air in your house. So mm. when we think about air pollution, we tend to think about outdoor air. Um, but that outdoor air, uh, also ends up in our homes and then it's kind of trapped. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> okay. and then anything that's in like your cleaning products and some of the combustion that happens if you have a gas stove, um, if you have gas heating can lead to this kind of buildup of, harmful stuff in indoor air and mm -hmm. Americans spend it's something like 95% of our time indoors on average. Oh, wow. So That's yeah. Insane. So I know shocking. <laughs> That's an wow. average. So probably some people, some people spend more time outdoors, but it's higher than you think. And then, uh, you know, obviously in winter months when we all kind of have our houses like sealed up, those of us who live in places with winter, <laughs> um, <laughs> when you don't like ventilate your house as often, um, this can be more of a problem. So the best way to filter your air at home is uh, a HEPA filter. Mm -hmm. um, those are kind of the most powerful, but the EPA has a whole little website about air purification systems for home that'll give you a lot of options. Um, and the HEPA filter... HEPA systems can be expensive, um, but there's a really cool DIY version if you Google HEPA filter box fan, where you essentially just buy the filter part without buying the purification system, and you fit it into a box fan, and you can like filter your indoor air through the filter that way and have cleaner air, and that's a much more cost effective version. Um, and you know, if you that also makes it easier to like have one in every room or, you know, so you're not like moving them around. Um, so a good water filter, a good air filter. And then the third kind of big one I recommend is swapping out um, cosmetic and personal care and cleaning products for less mm. toxic versions. And that one, I, so the way I did that was I kind of did it gradually over time rather than throwing everything away and starting fresh. I would just wait until I was about to run out of something and then use that as an opportunity to treat myself to a nice new non-toxic upgrade. So I love it. Um, there, yeah. And it can be really hard to just like try and read ingredient lists, even for mm -hmm. the researchers I talked to who have like PhDs in this, they were like, every, not everything is listed and sometimes can be can, different ingredients combined. So it's much easier to um, use like a third party um, app or verification mm -hmm. system. And there are a couple good ones out there. There's one called the healthy living app. Mm -hmm. Um, that's by the environmental working group that lets you, um, kind of browse by category or scan barcodes for personal care products and cleaning products. They do food too, actually. So if you're concerned about, um, like additives and cereal or something, mm -hmm. you can check those kinds of things on that app. Um, there's another right. one called Clearia, C-L-E-A-R-Y-A. -E and that's, like a Chrome browser extension that if you're okay. shopping for a product online, it'll pull up um, information about whether it, that product contains toxic chemicals. Um, and then there's another verification uh, program called Made Safe, and they have a big database of um, products. They've said, you know, the, these products are free of like this 100 ingredients that are potentially harmful for health. Um, so awesome. I found it easiest to just be like, oh, I'm about to be out of mascara. I'm going to go to one of those tools and type in mascara and like look at reviews for a couple and try one that way. Um, same with cleaning products. Uh, and then you mentioned microwaving and plastic earlier, and that actually is <laughs> another big one. It's another big one. Um, not heating food in plastic is um, a kind of easy way to quickly reduce. So <laughs> people, things say microwave safe. Um, things that are plastic. Mm -hmm. And that just means it's not going to melt. That means it will maintain its structural integrity in the microwave. That does not mean that it's been tested and no chemicals from the plastic are going to leach into your food. So mm -hmm. I just avoid, I just, especially um, for kids, because they're a little more sensitive to endocrine disrupting chemicals, they're still developing. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. Just don't heat, don't heat stuff in plastic. And I, you know, that goes for stuff like I had told my my mother-in-law about this or this came up at some point in writing the book. And so she was very mindful about not putting plastic in the microwave. But then she was about to make something for us in the crock pot and she was going to use one of those like plastic crock pot liners. And I was like, so that's Thanks. that is heating all of our food simultaneously in plastic. And she was like, oh, yeah. So anytime you're like cooking food in plastic, I would say don't do that. 
<laughs> just don't. <laughs> <laughs> just just don't do that. Yeah. Just heat it, heat it in something else. <laughs> yeah, I've gone down some rabbit holes like with my son because as as many as many like endocrine blockers as we've talked about, there's also things that are testosterone inhibitors and things like yeah. that. Um a lot of that can come from like actually milk and like the plastic tubing they use to milk cows and like anyway rabbit holes rabbit yeah. holes and i wish i saved all those um documents now that i'm talking to you about this um and i was just like i have a five-year-old son like what am i giving him you know well, now he's five yeah and i just my husband was like what is wrong with you and, I, and my husband's british and i was like you don't have the same issues <laughs> in the uk yeah. that we do here and then i would just start sending him all these links and he's like do i really have to read this and i was like i'm not crazy this is science <laughs> <laughs> it is hard to be the parent who has to convince everyone <laughs> uh, and then you just feel like you're crazy so like but yeah. exactly what you're saying like again like we're going through a merge a move so i'm like literally purging I, like I merge those words, move and purge. Um, I'm really <laughs> like purging myself off of like the plastics because of um, I. Okay, but and my five year old just came in to my room, so <laughs> that's who's saying <laughs> say no hi. Um, Hello. Hey, he's got his tablet. He's happy. He just wants to be closer to mommy. That's Good. cool. <laughs> um, but then you know, like for me, um, I swapped out exactly what you're saying. Like I rarely wear makeup. <laughs> Sorry, people. Uh, I really wear makeup <laughs> and um, I switch to like all like the like metal cups and stuff. And mm -hmm. um, what is it? Yeah, I think it's metal, aluminum, whatever it is. Um, yeah, it's not plastic. <laughs> That's what I know. Uh, and then I've started just trying to reheat everything on glass and it can be really frustrating. But it's like once you get into the groove of it, it's fine. Like. And even my cleaning products, I'm like, what am I spraying? Now, once in a while, I have to admit, I got to use bleach. Like, again, sure. child. Like, but, yeah, but it's, not yeah. every, it's not every day. It's not the, you know, countertop. So I, I feel like I get it from a parenting perspective where you're trying to find that balance or that, you know, easing in and out of it, like you said, with the makeup. It's It can be yeah. kind of overwhelming. But at the end of the day, it's like, especially things that you're putting on your skin, you, like our skin is our largest organ. They, it absorbs so much. You have to be mindful of it. Anyway, that's my soapbox. I'll step down. <laughs> well, I actually think that's a good um, a good point to touch on because if you're if you're wanting to like go slow, it's actually good to prioritize stuff that stays on your skin, right? Mm -hmm. So like um, shampoo, it's kind of on there and it's off. Still worth thinking about, you know, I'm at the point now where I've been doing this for two years. I've kind of turned everything over um, and it feels really nice actually to be like, oh, all mm -hmm. of my stuff now feels like healthy. Um, but shampoo, it's going to be on there and off as compared to like your face moisturizer mm -hmm. or your hand cream or something that's going to be on your skin getting absorbed all day, um, you know, start there start there with the thing that you're kind of like have on your skin for the longest absolutely that yeah so i'm glad we, i'm glad we brought that up so yeah. kind of going back to your initial experience with cancer your sister's diagnosis is there anything or i guess i should say what have you learned now after this whole journey talking to all these people putting this book together what do you wish you would have known that you could have used in those beginning moments of her diagnosis I wish I knew um, that she was going to be okay. <laughs> that would have obviously yeah. made things feel um, very different at the time. That's certainly what is scary when you get a new cancer diagnosis. Um, and I, I also think, you know, anytime someone gets a cancer diagnosis, you go through this kind of journey of, um, did, is this my fault? Did I do something wrong? Is this because I those couple cigarettes I smoked in mm -hmm. college? Is this because of where I grew up? Is this because, um, you know, I've been using these personal care products that have all this bad stuff in it. And I think it's really important to tell people, um, it is not your fault. Um, and, uh, we're, we're kind of constantly 
told this narrative that um, we are as individuals in control of our health, that if Mm -hmm. we uh, exercise and don't smoke and eat all the healthy foods, then we get to control whether we get sick or not. Um, And actually... Uh, we're really dependent on the health of our environments around us and the health of our communities and how clean our air is and how clean our water is. And so um, I really want to emphasize to people, and I I wish that I knew this at the time too, that, um, you know, uh, there's a much bigger picture um, that's important to consider. And uh, it's not just about like, what levers can you pull as an individual? It's also about saying, how can we make our communities safer? Mm. How can we make the products that we all need safer? It's really this kind of like, we're all, it's all for all for one. Like we're all yeah. either safe or we're all not. <laughs> um, yeah. It's not fair right. to ask individual consumers to to figure this out um, and to put this burden on parents who are already stressed and busy and worried about their kids' health, right? So we really need um, our lawmakers and our regulators to step up and do the right thing and make it so that you can buy anything at the store and feel confident that it's safe for you and your family. Oh, I love that. And that is said so well. Like it is true. Like it it takes it takes a village, not to be cliche, but yeah. if we want to impact change or you know well, first we have to know. Like you're saying, first we yeah. have to know. Now we know how can we change it. That is absolutely spectacular. I agree. Uh is there anything else you would like to share about a new war on cancer? And the uh, you stories. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you asked me earlier uh, if there's one chemical to avoid, oh, yeah, yeah. and I didn't answer that one. Um, so there, uh, there's not, but one kind of class of chemicals that I think about a lot and that I write about pretty extensively in the book uh, are PFAS that we've talked mm. about really briefly. Um, there, That actually refers to a class of more than 15,000 chemicals that all have similar chemical properties, and they... They're called forever chemicals because they don't break down. So they're once wow. they're in soil or water or our bodies, they're in there. <laughs> and um, we're, we're in this weird place with these right now where like awareness about the problems they're causing is increasing, but we're still manufacturing and using huge numbers of them. So these chemicals are used to make stuff waterproof and nonstick and grease resistant. So they're in you know, anti-stain spray, they're in waterproof clothes, they're in um, pots and pans, they're in food wrappers. Anytime you get a pizza, that piece of paper underneath the pizza in the box, that's been treated with PFAS. Um, So I I think a lot about those chemicals and how I, because Mm. they're forever, (laughs) um, I think a lot about like some simple steps to reduce my exposure to those. And there's a lot of information in the book about um, these chemicals specifically, what's being done about them and and kind of ways to avoid them in your everyday life. Um, And one of the big ones is filtering your water, which we already talked about. That's awesome, man. Okay, good. So stay away from those. Is there anything else? Yes. <laughs> we didn't know we needed to know about this new war on cancer. And I just keep picking the book up because I want people to see. Thank it. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just to reiterate, I know learning all of, about all of this can feel really overwhelming and scary, mm-hmm. but my book is ultimately really hopeful and I hope um, empowering and makes people feel like they can get involved in this movement to make our world safer for all of us and especially our children. Um, the book is came, just came out in May. It's new, uh, but it's available wherever books are sold. Um, if you buy it directly from the publisher, which is Island Press, um, you can get 20% off if you use the discount code WAR, W-A-R. Um, it's also available on Kindle and it's available as an audiobook. Um, so please read it and share it and join this movement. Oh, I love this. I think this is such a, again, such a great topic of conversation, something that I you know, know a little bit about just because of my five-year-old. And I think it is really important just to like, let parents know it seems overwhelming and like it's one more thing to think about, but it really does can, can change the health of not only like you and your child, but everybody in your community. So again, Christina, thank you so much for sharing your time with her. Again, this is her book, A New War on Cancer, The Unlikely Heroes. 
Claire's, I've only got to skim through a couple of the chapters, but some of these stories are so poetic and heartbreaking and poignant. And I think that it, it's just a good read overall. So I just want to thank you so much for your time, Christina. And I hope that everybody out there has learned something today that they didn't know they needed to know. Thank you so much, Brianna. That's my pleasure. That's my tagline. Cause what do you know as a parent?